think we all like to hear stories of underdogs being successful, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It just reminds us of what's possible when we put our minds to it, and even more so when God is gracing us to do something. You know, this past week, Apple became the first trillion-dollar publicly traded company. And Apple started in a garage, along with boxes of record albums and old arts and crafts projects. These people were smart, they were intelligent, but they were ordinary. They did extraordinary things. They had a vision to make technology more personal and accessible. That was the beginning of Apple. They took off. You know, Jesus began his own life here on earth in a little town of Bethlehem. We read the story every Christmas. It wasn't a garage, but it was similar. No space, no money. Instead of those arts and crafts boxes, they had donkeys and sheep. And this was very intentional. You see, this was foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem because God wanted to be personal and accessible to us. He was born into our fragile human condition, into poverty, in a stable. Because God's vision for us is so incredible. Apple might be a trillion-dollar company. We're a billion-person church, and billions since Jesus walked this earth. But the numbers are not what's most impressive, in either case, really. Apple wants to make technology more personal and accessible, and that's part of their vision, and that's great. They're doing a good job of that. It's inspired a ton of people. But God's vision for us is infinitely greater infinitely. And part of that was to make himself more personal and accessible to us. You know, I could have an iPhone in my pocket. That's great. But that doesn't come close to the fact that I can receive Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist into my body and allow him to transform me. So can all of you. That is incredible. That's the vision that God has for us to provide for us. That is, God gives himself completely to us in the form of bread and wine, the most ordinary things that have become extraordinary. Ordinary us can be made extraordinary also. Not because of anything we have done, not because of anything that we've merited, but simply because Christ dwells in us, he makes us extraordinary. We become a new Bethlehem, a new house of bread. That is what Bethlehem means. And God isn't done yet. Just as bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, and we become what we have received, God's vision is that that grace would go out from here once the Mass has ended and transform the entire world. What happens here becomes a torrent of grace, capable of transforming everything. When Pope Francis talks about our parishes becoming hubs of, min of mission, capable of transforming everything, he sees in the Eucharist the power to do so. We have been given everything that we need here. We really have it all. So the Eucharist isn't just for our own transformation, but for the whole world. And he uses us because he transforms us here. That's God's vision. It's amazing. And so we have to look past our ordinariness. Yeah, we're just a bunch of people, but we're God's people. Baptized into his grace to the Lord's death and resurrection, transformed 
transformed in him, transformed for him. The saints are a bunch of ordinary people who have done extraordinary things for God. So we look at each other and say, well, you're no Mother Teresa. You're no John Paul II. That's okay. The saints took little steps in love and did great things for God. And you and I can do exactly the same thing. They came from all walks of life. So do we. Sometimes we want a big sign in the sky that God actually wants to use us. But through our baptism, we have been called. We have been graced. That was the sign-up sheet. And through our baptism, we have been given all the gifts that we need. And through the Eucharist, we are nourished each and every week to go out and build God's kingdom. You know, in the gospel, the people asked Jesus for a sign, which was incredible because of what happened last week. Jesus multiplied food and fed 5,000. What more of a sign do they want? But what they wanted was a fulfillment of what happened in the first reading. The people of Israel were in the desert. They wanted the promised land. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Moses was saying, no, don't you trust? And God provided manna and quail. And in the time of Jesus, the people of Israel were under oppression. They were under Roman rule. And so they wanted a military sign. Kick out the Romans or we won't believe. And Jesus is saying, there's something so much broader that God has. Yes, he wants to provide for his people Israel, but he wants to provide for the whole world. And the bread of life that is Jesus will go out and feed the nations. He wants freedom for everyone, and that's what he did for us on the cross. He died for us all. And what we receive in the Eucharist is the representation of that great mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus provides for everyone. And the sign continues throughout history in that we can come to the altar, we can receive him no matter where we are. Here in Sackville or in Japan, Wherever we are, we can go and receive the nourishment that God has provided for us, his people. And so we have to remember not to put God in a box, not to come to him with our expectations that God would talk to us, speak to us in a certain way, that God can't use us unless he provides a certain sign but to remember the grace of our baptism, to remember that we are called, we are equipped, and that we meet God as he is, as he meets us, as we are. He is unchanging, and his ways are not our ways. And he can accomplish things through us if he wants to. He's God, and we're not. But he can certainly use us to do great things. His desire hasn't changed for the world to know him, for the world to experience him. And so he has made himself personal and accessible through the Eucharist. Through the fall, we had cut ourselves off from God. And it was not God who hid himself from us, but it was us who hid ourselves from God. And through the cross and through the Eucharist, that has been reversed. And in fact, God is more accessible now than he ever was. God dwells in us. We become that house of bread. We are given the daily bread, the nourishment, the grace to do all the things that he wants us to do. And so we believe. We believe in the power of the Eucharist to transform lives. First our own and then everyone else's as we go forth from here, bringing the grace that we have received. The passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus has changed the world forever. 
and we receive that same sacrifice into our bodies. So how can we not be transformed? And how can we not transform the world? We bring the hope of the world with us. So what is the Lord transforming in you? And how will he continue to use you to transform the world? As you're praying, as you're receiving the Eucharist, as you're giving yourself to the Lord every day, what's he putting on your heart? What's he working on? Maybe he's, he's convincing you to become kinder, gentler, more loving. He's working on jealousy or anger or whatever it is. You know we can bring that here? As the priest offers the sacrifice, we can unite that to that sacrifice and ask for extra grace to make that fruitful. And as he's calling us to transform the world through radical hospitality, maybe it's through caring for a sick family member, maybe it's through sharing our faith, we can bring that here and unite that to the sacrifice of the Mass and ask the Lord to pour out his grace in abundance, to make that extra fruitful. It all flows in and through the Eucharist. Everything. All of it. And so as God has been intentional with us, we want to be intentional with God. To bring those things to Him. As we come to Mass and as we spend time in adoration, praying for ourselves, praying for others, those we'll encounter throughout our week, Asking God to give us exactly what we need as his beloved children and his beloved disciples to build his kingdom. He wants that for us. He loves us. He's uniting us in the sacrifice. He's with us. He is so near. He's nearer to us now than he's ever been. He transforms us as we receive him. And his vision for us personally and for us as a church is expansive. It goes out. It transforms the world. And we might only see pieces of it at a time. That's okay. It's bigger than us. But the pieces that we can see are beautiful. We can see what he's done for us. He's transformed us. He continues to transform us. And he wants to transform this world. So we need to believe that that he's not done and he's got greater and greater things that he wants to do in and through us. Through ordinary us, he can do extraordinary things because it's not about us, it's about him and his grace. So we need to believe that. That the bread of life that has transformed the world will continue to do so as we unite ourselves to him and to each other as we go and proclaim what God has done for us to the world, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. God's grace is amazing. Let's avail ourselves of it. Let's give him permission to do whatever he wants in our lives. As we receive the Eucharist today, let's bring before him all our weaknesses, all our insecurities, and all our gifts all our joys, and allow him to transform that for the renewal of the world. Amen?